In the indomitable social hierarchy of the United States, old money symbolizes families whose wealth has been passed down through many generations like a well-loved family heirloom. These are the dynasties whose fortunes have been so enduring that their bank accounts seem to have discovered the fountain of youth. Yet navigating through this sea of affluence isn't just about staying afloat. It's about doing so with style, and it's not been smooth sailing for all. Consider the early Vanderbilts and Goulds, whose riches once eclipsed many a nation's GDP, only to see their fortunes deflate like a souffle in a thunderstorm. Their stories of lavishness now faint echoes. Then there's the tale of the financial phoenixes, the Rockefellers and Mellons. Initially tagged as new money, these families played the long game, turning their nouveau riche badges into old money medals of honor. In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we're rolling out the red carpet for America's old money families, who didn't just cling to their fortunes, they catapulted them into the stratosphere. Be prepared for a parade of familiar surnames mingled with a few curveballs, because in our elite circle, longevity is key. So if you're wondering why modern magnates like Bezos, Gates or Musk are conspicuously absent from our list, remember, in this hallowed hall of fiscal endurance, time is the ultimate gatekeeper. We're not just talking wealthy, we're talking American dynasties that have defined opulence for three generations or more, as we describe. The richest old money families in America who are still wealthy. Number five, the DuPont family. Net worth, $18.1 billion. First on our list of the richest old money families in America is one you might have heard of already, especially if you're from the East Coast. With an approximate $18.1 billion in the coffers as of 2024, they're not just any old money clan. They're a veritable institution in the United States with a lineage of lucre that stretches back to the early 19th century. That's over two centuries of making bank, making history, and making a little bit of controversy along the way. The tale begins with Eluther Irene Dupont, a French chemist who took one look at the shoddy and pricey gunpowder in his adopted country and thought, I can do better, and did he ever. Setting up shop in 1802 by the scenic Brandywine River near Wilmington, Delaware, he rolled out a gunpowder mill that turned out to be a gold mine, especially when the War of 1812 had Americans clamoring for quality gunpowder. Just like that, the DuPont family was on the map, and American industry had a new heavyweight. But why stop at gunpowder? As the 19th turned into the 20th century, the DuPonts branched out faster than a family tree in a fairy tale. From dynamite to the nascent automotive industry, their fingers were in every pie, making sure the money kept rolling in. And that stake in General Motors? It wasn't just a savvy investment. It was a megaphone blast announcing that the DuPonts weren't merely visiting the high stakes table of American enterprise. They were permanent fixtures, diversifying their empire across various sectors with the finesse of old school tycoons. But the plot thickens when you peek behind the curtain of this illustrious dynasty. The DuPont saga is not without its dark chapters and eyebrow raising controversies that have stirred the pot over the generations. Their history is dotted with legal battles, environmental issues, and the kind of family dramas that could give soap operas a run for their money. Take, for example, their environmental record. The DuPonts have found themselves in hot water more than once, with their chemical ventures sometimes leaving a less than stellar mark on Mother Earth. From pollution lawsuits to the unsettling revelations about the health impacts of Teflon production, the family's industrial activities have sometimes clashed with environmental and health advocates, sparking debates and legal actions. Another glaring chapter in the DuPont family's history is the case of John Eluther DuPont, an heir to the family fortune. In a tragic turn of events steeped in mental illness and wealth's isolating effects, John DuPont murdered Olympic wrestler Dave Schultz in 1996, dramatized in the excellent film Foxcatcher, and an incident that cast a long shadow over the family, bringing to light the darker side of immense wealth and the mental health struggles that can accompany it. Through it all, the DuPonts have managed to maintain their wealth and status into the 21st century, albeit not without navigating the complexities and challenges that come with their vast wealth and influence. 
From Eluter Irene's pioneering gunpowder mill to a portfolio that reads like the who's who of American business, they've not just survived, they've thrived, keeping the family fortune not just intact, but flourishing. But it's not all about making money. The Duponts have a softer side too, dabbling in philanthropy and opening their former estates to the public as museums, gardens and parks. Places like Winterthur, Nemours and Eleutherian Mills aren't just tourist attractions. They're tributes to the family's green fingers and their commitment to preserving cultural and environmental legacies. As for their current business interests, let's just say the Duponts have never put all their eggs in one basket. From the Bellevue Stratford Hotel to General Motors, and even into the realms of coal, iron and explosives, courtesy of Hercules Powder Company, their investment strategy has been as varied as it has been visionary. Though the nitty-gritty of their current billions worth portfolio might be shrouded in mystery, one thing's for sure. Their diversified approach across chemicals, automotive and finance is a blueprint for sustaining wealth that even the most astute moguls could learn from. Number four, the Hearst family. Net worth, 28 billion. Dive into the saga of the Hearst family and you'll find yourself in an epic tale worth more than 28 billion US dollars. Indeed, it's a story that reads like a blockbuster script with its roots reaching back to the late 19th century, thanks to the audacious George Hearst. You see, George, a man with a penchant for the earth's hidden treasures struck it rich in mining. And his golden ticket was the Comstock load in Nevada during the gold fever of the 1850s and 60s, followed by a jackpot with the Homestake mine in South Dakota in 1877. But this wasn't just any old mine. It was the mother load of gold mines in North America, cementing the Hearst name in the annals of American wealth. But the tale doesn't end there. It only gets juicier with George's son, William Randolph Hearst. Born with the same fire in his belly, William took the family fortune to dizzying new heights. Picture a young William taking over the San Francisco Examiner in 1887, a newspaper his father snagged in a poker game because that's how the Hearsts roll, transforming it into the cornerstone of what would become a media empire. Then, aiming higher, he grabbed the New York Journal in 1895, catapulting the Hearsts into the media stratosphere. Under William's watchful eye, the Hearst Corporation ballooned into a media juggernaut, scooping up newspapers, magazines, and even film studios. We're talking about a portfolio that boasts big names like Cosmopolitan and Harper's Bazaar. It's the kind of empire that would make even the most seasoned moguls do a double take. But here's where the Hearsts really play 4D chess. When William Randolph Hearst met his maker in 1951, his will wasn't just a document. It was a strategic masterpiece. He whipped up a trust to keep the family jewels locked down and professionally managed rather than splitting the bounty among his heirs. And this wasn't just about keeping the cash in the family. It was about ensuring the Hearst legacy would outlive them all, stipulating that the trust would only dissolve once his grandchildren had all taken their final bows. And thus, the Hearst family's fortune has not just endured, but thrived navigating through five generations of changing times and fortunes. These days, beyond the headlines and broadcasting waves, the Hearst descendants have ventured into realms as vast as real estate and as niche as B2B ventures, creating a financial fortress that seems almost impenetrable. And with William Randolph Hearst III, the great-grandson of the founding father of the Hearst dynasty, at the helm as chairman, the Hearst Corporation remains a titan in the shadows, its influence woven deep into the fabric of global media and beyond. Not just content with a piece of the media pie, Hearst owns hefty shares in giants like A&E Networks and ESPN in a dazzling dance of partnership with the Walt Disney Company. These stakes are not just lines on a ledger, they're golden geese laying platinum eggs, fueling the Hearst Empire's ever-expanding wealth. But why stop at media when the world is full of opportunities? The Hearsts certainly didn't. Hearst Ventures, the family's venture capital arm, scouts the horizon for the next big thing, injecting capital into fledgling companies that promise to redefine industries. Among the constellation of Hearsts guiding this empire, William Randolph Hearst III shines the brightest as chairman. Yet, 
The boardroom is crowded with the legacy's bearers, Lisa Hurst Hageman, George Randolph Hearst III, and Virginia Hearst Rant. Grandchildren of the legendary William Randolph Hearst, each wielding influence over the dynasty's direction. The Hearst riches, however, aren't just about the abstract digits of stocks and shares. They're tangibly anchored in the earth itself. The Hearst's dominion extends over a green empire of forests and timberland in California, with an acquisition spree adding 20,000 acres to their green belt, which already spans a vast 62,000 acres. This isn't merely land. It's a renewable gold mine, contributing a significant chunk to the Hearst net worth and ensuring a green yet golden legacy. Therefore, in the ever unfolding story of the Hearst family, each chapter adds layers to their legend. With each generation, the Hearsts not only preserve their heritage, but also expand it, ensuring their place not just in the history books, but in the future's ledger too. Number three, the Johnson family of Fidelity Investments. Net worth, 37 billion US dollars. The Johnson family, the masterminds behind Fidelity Investments, have built a towering $37 billion empire, all under the watchful eye of one of the most illustrious old money states, Massachusetts. This tale begins with Edward C. Johnson II, not just a Boston lawyer with a knack for the legal, but a visionary who saw gold where others saw dust. In 1946, he took a gamble on Fidelity Management and Research Company, a move that would ink the Johnson name in financial law. And Edward, he was a pioneer. So much so that by 1943, he was steering the Fidelity Fundship as its president and director, navigating through the choppy waters of the Great Depression, a time when banks were toppling like dominoes. Yet, the Fidelity Fund stood tall, the sole survivor approved by John C. Hull, Massachusetts's securities director. This wasn't just luck, it was the first note in what would become a symphony of success, and the next generation became even stronger with Edward's son, Ned Johnson. In 1957, young Ned stepped into Fidelity as a research analyst, but he wasn't content to stay in the shadows. Following his father's retirement, Ned took the helm as chairman and CEO, and oh, how he sailed the ship. Under his watch, Fidelity didn't just grow, it exploded from managing a respectable 3.9 billion in assets in 1972 to a jaw-dropping $2.1 trillion by 2016, with an additional $5.7 trillion under administration. From millions to trillions, Ned indeed turned Fidelity into a financial juggernaut. But let's not box the Johnsons into the New England corner. Their financial tentacles stretch far and wide. They've bagged a hefty 40% slice of Fidelity International, the globe-trotting cousin catering to clients beyond the North American shores, boasting a cool $714 billion in assets as of the latest tally. And that's just for starters. Their investment smorgasbord sprawls across sectors like real estate, where Pembroke Real Estate waves the family flag to telecommunications with Colt Group SA, not to mention a dip into the oil wells of Discovery Natural Resources, and even a venture capital arm under eight roads. Thus, the Johnson portfolio is less a portfolio and more a treasure chest of diverse riches. And at the helm of this financial galleon stands Abigail Johnson, the CEO, president, and Fidelity's crown jewel shareholder. Under Abby's stewardship, Fidelity hasn't just grown. It's flourished, expanding its asset base and boldly venturing into the crypto waters, offering investment options for the institutionally adventurous. Her brother, Edward C. Johnson IV, mans the real estate battleship Pembroke Real Estate and boasts a hefty stake in the Fidelity Empire, alongside investments in Fidelity International and Northern Neck investors. And Abigail's personal coffers are estimated at a staggering $22.6 billion, placing her among the pantheon of the globe's wealthiest women. As for Edward IV, his treasure chest is filled with the fruits of a 7.5% stake in FMR, a share bolstered by the dispersal of their father, Edward III's fortune. But the Johnson wealth isn't just sprawling, it's meticulously managed through Impresa management, cradling about $13.4 billion in assets that whisper of insider ownership, with the family holding the reins to 80% of this bounty. Meanwhile, 
Elizabeth Johnson, another of the clan, presides over a horse farm kingdom in Wellington, Florida, adding a dash of equestrian flair to the family's diverse interests. So, as Fidelity Investments weaves through the fabric of finance, adapting, expanding and innovating, the Johnson family sails on, charting courses through diverse financial seas. Number two, the Cargill Macmillan family. Net worth, $56.2 billion. The Cargill Macmillan family, with their staggering $56.2 billion fortune, isn't just wealthy. They're financial royalty, boasting 14 billionaires, setting the reported record for the most ultra-wealthy family members in one brood in US history. And their vast wealth springs from the fertile grounds of Cargill Inc., the titan of the agribusiness sector, and the largest private corporation in the United States by revenue. Now this financial empire traces its roots back to 1865, when William Wallace Cargill, a visionary son of a Scottish sea captain, laid the cornerstone of what would become a colossal legacy. Starting with a humble grain storage business in Conover, Iowa, William tapped into the agricultural boom of the Midwest. His strategic acumen in leveraging grain storage facilities catered to the burgeoning needs of farmers during the American frontier's expansion. By hoarding grain until market conditions turned favorable, William didn't just make a fortune. He sowed the seeds of an enduring financial dynasty. The baton of wealth was then relayed across over five generations. The torch, initially ignited by W.W. Cargill, was passed to his son-in-law, John H. Macmillan Sr. in 1909, thus introducing the Macmillan lineage into the enterprise. Under Macmillan's stewardship, the company broadened its horizon, delving into flour milling, feed manufacturing, and a smorgasbord of agribusiness ventures from food processing to commodity trading and risk management. As the 20th century infilled into the 21st, the Cargill Macmillan lineage nurtured their behemoth, all the while cloaking their operations in a veil of privacy befitting their privately held status. Despite shunning the limelight of public markets, Cargill Incorporated's financial might has been unmistakable, with revenue streams gushing into the billions, cementing the family's place in the pantheon of global wealth. Indeed, every year, like clockwork, the Cargill Macmillan clan skims a cool 18% off the top of Cargill Incorporated's net profits, tucking it away as dividends. It's not just pocket change, it's a testament to their towering presence in the agribusiness colossus they've built and meticulously nurtured. And among this affluent family, a few stars shine particularly bright thanks to their hefty wallets and deep ties to the company's heartbeat. James Cargill, Austin Cargill and Marianne Liebman, all great-grandchildren of the legendary William Wallace Cargill, each boast a fortune that would make Midas green with envy, clocking in at a cool $5.4 billion apiece. Yes, that means each of them individually has at least that much, as of the latest whispers from the world of wealth. This trio, alongside Pauline Keeneth and Gwendolyn Sontime Meyer, have watched their fortunes swell in harmony with Cargill's triumphs, etching the family's name even deeper into the annals of global affluence. In this dynasty, each member plays a part in the grand scheme of agribusiness domination, from the fields of the Midwest to the executive boardrooms where decisions shape the future of food, finance, and beyond. Number one, the Mars family. Net worth, $115.4 billion. And topping our list is a family with more money than most can fathom the Mars dynasty, who have gained unfathomable riches through the sweet success of Mars Incorporated. This behemoth in the confectionery, pet care, and food product industries owes its prosperity to the candy empire dreamt up by Franklin Clarence Mars in the early 20th century. Franklin, or Frank C. Mars as he's more fondly remembered, was the mastermind behind the family's fortune. Born in September 1883, he dipped his toes into the confectionery waters at a tender age. And his journey began with the Nougat House in Tacoma, Washington in 1911. But it was the launch of the Milky Way Bar in 1923 that really put the Mars name on the map. This chocolate delight didn't just satisfy sweet tooths, it catapulted Mars, incorporated to the forefront of the candy industry. Then, 
The Roaring Twenties were indeed roaring for the Mars clan, as this era laid the golden bricks of their fortune. The Milky Way's success, followed by the birth of other sweet legends like Snickers and M&Ms, cemented Mars, incorporated status as a confectionery titan. Frank's knack for innovation in candy creation and marketing wizardry fueled the company's explosive growth and the family's burgeoning bank accounts. This sweet legacy has been meticulously crafted and preserved across four generations, from Frank C. Mars to his son, Forrest Edward Mars Sr., and down the lineage to Forrest's offspring and their children. Forrest E. Mars Sr., born on the 21st of March 1904, was pivotal in taking the Mars empire global and diversifying into realms beyond candy, venturing into pet care and other food arenas. This strategic expansion not only diversified the family's portfolio, but anchored their financial dominance even more firmly. And Forrest E. Mars Sr.'s children, including Forrest E. Mars Jr., John Mars, and Jacqueline Mars, inherited this sugary empire and have been the custodians of its growth, steering Mars towards new horizons. And the third generation of the Mars lineage has played a crucial role in ensuring the company's star shines bright in the global market, blending traditional values with modern innovations. At the forefront of this dynasty stands Jacqueline Mars, born in 1939, whose name is synonymous with both wealth and generosity. Jacqueline, alongside her brother John, inherits the mantle of co-ownership of Mars, though neither delves into the day-to-day -day management of the conglomerate. With a fortune estimated at $23.6 billion, Jacqueline's presence on Forbes 2019 roster of the world's wealthiest individuals is as prominent as it is deserved, thanks to her substantial philanthropic endeavors and patronage of the arts. And John Mars, Jacqueline's brother, born in 1935, mirrors his sister in both net worth and his role within the company. Holding an impressive fortune also pegged at 23 billion or so, John has similarly stepped back from the operational helm, yet his influence remains intact, evidenced by his honorary knighthood from our late Queen Elizabeth II in 2015 and his involvement with the Mars Foundation. And the legacy of Forrest Mars Jr., who departed in 2016, lives on through his four daughters, Victoria, Valerie, Pamela and Marika Mars, each inheriting an 8% stake in the family empire. Victoria, once the chair of Mars board, alongside Pamela, who also served in a similar capacity before stepping down, have left indelible marks on the company's governance. Meanwhile, Valerie and Marika persist in their active roles within the company and its board, maintaining the Mars family's enduring legacy and stewardship of the business. Together, the four sisters command a collective net worth of 24 billion US dollars, a symbol of the enduring value and growth of Mars Incorporated. Thus, the Mars family's history is not merely a chronicle of wealth accumulation, but a story of strategic expansion, philanthropic leadership, and a deep-seated commitment to the arts and community. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Which of these old money families would you like us to do a longer form in-depth history of? We love making content based on your requests, so be sure to leave us your thoughts below, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks again for joining us on another episode of Old Money Luxury, and cheers until next time.